So welcome everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Sean and Penny for being prepared to give our seminar today. It's uh, a little bit out of our usual realm, um, hearing from uh, historians and archeologists. And uh, I, I, I'm very excited to hear how the AAO software team is helping uh, the data collection from um, all of the work that, that you guys have been doing for the last number of years. So uh, I'll just briefly introduce uh, Sean and Penny as co-directors of the FAMES project. Um, and uh, uh, researchers at Macquarie University. And uh, I'll hand over directly to Sean to get the ball rolling. Thank you very much, Sean and Penny. Thanks, Andrew. I will go ahead and start my screen share. Then, okay. So I'll make this, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see in a bit this, um, uh, presentations on GitHub, so anyone who wants the slide deck uh, can get it. And um, what uh, uh, what Penny and I are going to do today is uh, give a brief introduction to FAMES and then um, even briefer, I, I, I think, overview of the work that we're doing as uh, with you as um, uh, part of the um, uh, as part of the um, ARDC uh, investment that we got to rebuild FAMES. Uh, but I thought what I'd start with is a little bit of broader background, um, and then I'll hand over to, uh, uh, to to Penny for a history of the project. Um, so, Fames uh, Fames got started at a uh, at, at a at a workshop, a stock taking workshop back in 2012, uh, and at the time it was limited to archaeology, uh, and we thought that what we were going to do at that time was produce uh, sort of a series of data loggers, um, you know, one for uh, one or two for uh, archaeological surface survey, pedestrian survey, when people go through the landscape and record uh, archaeological ma surface materials, uh, one or two for excavations of different types, uh, one for ceramics, one for lithics, and that these would be extensible. Um, and there are a number of examples of, um, of, of, of this sort of application for field data, uh, for field data collection. Um, the um, American School of Classical Studies at, the, um, uh, at, at their excavations at the Athenian Agora, for example, have made an application. <laughs> They've got lots of money. So they made an application to do American School of Classical Studies at the Athenian Agora style excavations and a few other, a handful of other projects work close, uh, closely enough to that workflow that they are, that they were, and that data schema that they were able to adopt it. Um, you know, so, so there are examples of that kind of application but um, we found out pretty quickly when we got uh, a, about 40 or 50 archaeologists together and started talking about data standards that they that, that, that this was just not happening data standards I mean in in archaeology um, and casting a, or, or stepping back a bit this is a very common um, attribute or aspect of small science or small data research uh, that uh, uh, that there's generally a lack of resources a lack of of lack of standards, a lack of uh, of, of, of um, um, you know typical ways of doing things, uh, and so we had to really change our uh, our, our approach. Um, and we started taking a, a harder look, um, and I've referenced Borgman here, uh, that uh, she's got uh, quite a bit on this, uh, but even back earlier in 2011, 2012, there'd been some pub uh, published work on it, that this small data, small science, long tail, whatever you want to call it, research um, that characterizes not only archaeology, but as we as we came to discover, uh, also most other field, uh, of at least human medi human mediated field work. Uh, field research tended to be smaller scale, lots of different approaches. The data is quite heterogeneous uh, in, in terms of what types of data you're collecting, what data structures are needed to, you know, to, to, uh, to um, uh, house it in a reasonable sort of way. Um, that um, that this kind of work, uh, a lot of it isn't your your sort of stereotypical, uh, um, you know, deductive like experimental scientific field work. It's mu it's more inductive or at least cyclical or at like uh, what they call abductive research, where there'll be an inductive phase where you'll you'll develop hypotheses and then 
a, maybe a deductive phase where you'll go get new data to test against those hypotheses. But what this means is that a lot of the data, it, there's a lot of serendipity involved, the data, the data structures, the workflows, you, you don't really know what they are until you actually get into your, into your research. Um, as I mentioned, a relative lack of standards, limited funding is another typical one. And, um, you know, and, and uh, these sort of well-known problems with, um, you know, small data sorts of disciplines, um, you know, are, are only getting harder as certain approaches that are taking off in these uh, disciplines, including ge uh, geophysical re uh, remote sensing, um, and uh, particularly photogrammetry, then also give you some big data problems at the same time. You've still got the small data problems don't go away, but then suddenly you can generate, you know, a terabyte, a, you know, a, a, what a, a terabyte every three or four. If it's one person doing it, you can generate a terabyte of photogrammetry uh, imagery in a few days. And, you, you know, you get five people doing it and you do it for a month and pretty soon you've got, I think, what uh, even... Brian, who, uh, you know, uh, always laughs when people talk about big data, I think, uh, in, in the humanities and social sciences, uh, I think he even agrees that it gets to be tricky to handle the size of the data. Um, so that being able to handle uh, small science research was, was uh, part of it. The other thing was that our part of the data life cycle, the capture and collect uh, part here is a bit um, uh, less mature in, in field disciplines than the publication side of uh, the data publication dissemination archiving side, uh, that there are data repositories, those are out there. Uh, even on, if you talk about processing and analysis, a lot of field disciplines have science gateways, virtual labs, um, virtual research environments, whatever you want to, uh, uh, whatever you want to call them. But you know, the data capture was underdeveloped and we decided to really focus on, uh, on, on that. So FAMES is really this combination of, of trying to cater to the needs of small science, small data, long tail disciplines with a lack of, of sophisticated tools in the, the data capture phase. So that's a little bit of broader background and I will stop my share now and hand over to Penny. Put my... Uh, and see if this is going to work. Okay. So I am just going to talk through some of the details of what FAMES in its current iteration offers and some of the design choices that we made. Sean mentioned the complexity of designing for archaeologists who are standards averse and create a broad range of different or collect a broad range of data types across many different fields. So we ended up developing some unique features that met some of those needs. And it was only over time that we realized how different uh, and useful they are to other fields. So I'm just going to talk through some of the key features of FAMES 2.6 as it is now. The first is that all the workflows are completely customizable. There is no standard way to collect or record anything. Uh, any user can define what they want to collect, the order in which they do it, what field types they have, they have full control. We are offline capable, which is important for a lot of archeological work. So you can either go off into the field with your own uh, standalone server with a low powered device and collect all of your data without connecting to the internet for a week or a month, however you wish to do it, or you can synchronize with an online server. You have those two choices. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have full uh, data provenance and version history. So you can roll back to the original record. You can see, this is on the server only at the moment, you can see all changes that were made at all times. So if you have a big team with a lot of uh, workers of, of different skill levels, you can see that the error was introduced by the student you had working with you on day three, you can roll back to that or correct it at that time. So all um, data changes are recorded and that's been really useful for some uh, of our users. We treat all kinds of data as data, no matter what it is. So instead of um, going out to the field with a GIS platform that you might add some other data to, we collect structured data, free text, GIS data, multimedia, it's, it's all part of the interface. There's no um, cherry picking or, or prioritizing one kind of data over another. 
We have a lightweight mobile GIS with um, basic layer management. You can uh, draw in raster or vector uh, files. Raster, depending on how much capacity you have on your device, when you're out in the field, you don't want anything that's too big. And we can do simple shape creation as well. We have a way of managing uh, users um, mostly um, on the device, uh, sorry, on, on the server, we have user control and we can connect to different sensors. So Bluetooth, uh, GI, mobile GIS, we can do label printing, barcode scanning, that sort of thing. Uh, we have, uh, I just cannot actually read under my screen at the moment. Uh, we have multimedia uh, management and metadata. There is, validation and automation on the device or the server and this is part of the custom workflows where you can um, not allow a user to enter a certain value you can give them a warning that 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 value that they've entered is not what you would like they have the chance to correct it before they move on to the, the next one all of that is custom logic that we can script at the user's request they could do it themselves if they know how to uh, use the uh, coding interface we also have um, what we call localization, the ability to deploy a single module or workflow in any language as long as it's scripted. So that can be actual languages, English, Spanish, um, French, however you, uh, whatever you need. It could also be different um, uh, user requests for different terminology. So we found in archeology span that some ceramic specialists call fabric material, they call material class. You could actually de deploy the precise same workflow across people who have sort of different uh, vocabularies that they use in their work using this uh, interface. One of our um, other key features that we have is our note taking and certainty metadata that can be deployed to any uh, field or any piece of data that you collect. We think of this as like a marginal note that you might make on a notebook. So you capture your, um, your data, which might be that it's a hut and you can make a note that um, it seemed to be a, a brick hut versus, or it may have been the um, warden's hut rather than somebody else's. That's a, a note that gets buried in the metadata on the screen. You won't necessarily see it. You can still do any analysis you need, but that information is captured behind the scenes. We also have uh, metadata for certainty. So you can uh, allocate a confidence rating to any piece of data that you collect, which has been really useful in archaeology where we're frequently uncertain about many things. So again, you might select hut and you put a certainty value of, of 50 or 75% because you're not really sure if it's a hut, but you want to capture some information. You don't just want to say unknown. Our, um, we also have a, a help feature, uh, access through that same point in our current, in the current version of the software, where you have um, image-based help to help you or a user who's not familiar with the workflow to capture that information. So wherever you are, you can long press and get more information about how to collect that information in that particular spot. We have um, the capacity to do uh, very well structured vocabularies. They can also be um, attached to an image so you can see the image on the screen instead of the word. They have the capacity to be um, integrated with linked open data and with online uh, vocabularies and ontologies. Sadly, no one has taken us up on this feature yet. And one of the things we want to uh, make happen in FAMES 3 is make sure we have some really good test cases of fully integrated um, online ontologies. And also we can export data in a bunch of different formats. We have a few standard export formats and anything could be customized uh, to export in, in any way. We encourage our users to share their modules on GitHub so that others can borrow that module, adapt it and change it so that we're not all going back and reinventing the wheel every time. Um, Sean may correct me, but I, I believe the only uh, modules that have been shared are ones that we have been involved in, but we do encourage users to, um, to share all of their work. The original concept of FAMES was a, a federation, and our first project was focused not just on building the mobile app, but providing a repository for archaeology. We, have no, we no longer support that as a standalone repository. We have now moved all of the records we collected into 
an American repository for archaeological data. And our, our focus for FAME 3 is we, we will still have some standard exports to repositories um, that we work with. So TDAO and Open Context are two examples, but we would like to have a um, better way of getting data out to any other uh, products that exist now or repositories that are there now and will be in the future. We are open source, always have been, always will be for our core functionality. And um, just very quickly, because we're now running a little bit short on time, uh, over the past nine years, we've supported or we've created 64 different customised workflows for field work, excavation and also archival work. That has been um, 48 workflow, workflows that have actually been deployed. They went on the ground over 40 projects. So of course, some projects have multiple workflows. We've got had supported hundreds of users, tens of thousands of hours on the platform. And of course, we originally built the app for archaeologists, but Within a few years, we started working with geoscience uh, teams, ecologists, oral historians, and also uh, linguists. So we now actually have a, a very diverse uh, set of workflows across a number of fields. Here's an example, or here's a list of some of our bigger deployments. Uh, and the Cape York team are in the field at the moment. I think, Sean, you might correct me on that. Um, our Blue Mountains work, we're still actively using and um, the uh, Capricorn project, they're still regularly sending out field teams using that, uh, that module. Uh, so FAMES 3.0, where we are now. Sean, you're happy for me to just keep gabbering? Yeah? Good -o. Uh So FAMES 2.6 in its current form is nearing the end of its useful life. We probably should be saying at this point that it has ended its life, but we keep using it and it actually keeps working and if you're working off a standalone server it just keeps rocking on so um, it hasn't yet died uh, but it's it's just too costly to support in its current form and has too many limitations uh, in 2016 so the, the last major software update was in 2014 and we've had a few uh, little updates and upgrades since then but that was the last time that there was any new features that were added to the software in 2016, we were lucky to work with the CIRO on, Pro, on Prime program to bring a business approach to this software. Our, our um, you know, reason for being is to support research, but we realized we needed to bring a different approach to what we were doing so that we could have software that would survive in the longer term. So we brought a business approach to the software and sat down with 70 different users and potential users of FAMES and really nitpicked you know, we nitpicked them on what they liked and didn't like and what were some of the problems with FAMES. And that was an incredibly insightful process to go through. In 2017, we won a, a design prize for our plan for rebuilding FAMES 3.0. And then we were very lucky in late 2000, in 2019, to receive funding from the ARDC to build FAMES 3 from the ground up. So, the key goals for FAMES 3, the first is to retain all of the really good stuff in FAMES 2.6. We have a lot of users who really like many of the features that we've developed um, through our own uh, curious little path and we really want to retain all of those things. But we need to you know, open it up and do it in a way that will solve some of the problems of users who uh, didn't feel confident to use FAMES or had some issues with it. The biggest uh, hindrance and barrier was that we were Android only. So it was really clear from the beginning that we needed to be cross-platform, which we now are. Our alpha release has uh, demonstrated that we are cross-platform on Android, iOS and desktop. Another big problem was the fact that users relied on us to do the coding. When we originally designed FAMES, we had an idea we had a few individuals who said they would be very happy to do some basic XML scripting. Turned out they weren't. They, they, they weren't. Researchers are just too busy to, uh, you know, dive into that kind of um, coding language and do that sort of work. So we ended up doing the work, which takes time. Um, the, the barrier of explaining to someone else what you need takes up a lot of your time. So we really need a self-service option where researchers can go and design their own workflows without us. 
we also needed to improve the way we got data off the app um, and then back into it so that you could go and do some field data collection, do a little bit of editing work and then actually push it back out to go back to your next season. That was a bit of an issue with FAMES uh, 2.6. Um, and I'm just going to skip through some of these things so that we can get to the next part. Um, the the um, enterprise features that we realised we needed were a more sophisticated approach to user management reporting. We needed a better server interface so that users, uh, researchers who are working for universities could access and share access to the modules in a more efficient way. At the moment, you have to log on to the server, you manually enter people's names and email addresses and it just doesn't scale. We needed to provide um, some of those features. In the long run, continue to support our open source software, which we always will. There will always be a free way to use frames, but we need to add on some more sophisticated um, services that users would be willing to pay for so that we can underwrite and fund those um, software updates over time. So we're pushing for a cross model. Sean, do you want to jump in here and quickly go through the development approaches? Oh, I, I think the AAO team probably knows more about this than I do. Uh, but no, this just uh, lay, uh, lays out um, uh, what was what the product of our uh, technical elaboration um, uh, was. Uh, and what direction it's going in now. Not everything has been settled. Uh, I think wisely, uh, our, our uh, two technical people on our side, uh, Brian and Steve, Brian Bolson Stanton, Steve Cassidy, and the AO team uh, decided to, to, to really nail down the core, um, core, uh, I guess you could say, capacities first, that it's cross platform, that we see that synchronization is working. Um, you know that um, uh, and and that dat data can be collected successfully and then replicates across the uh, you know the system as necessary. Uh, so these are some of the technologies that that we're using. Um, I might comment on a couple of them in that um, what um, the uh, the SQL data stores that are available for mobile devices are pretty limited. It's 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 uh, pretty well pretty much SQL light and that's about it. Uh, and we found that uh, imposed some scalability and performance problems that were really unacceptable. So we've moved to uh, CouchDB, PouchDB for um, for this one. Um, everyone's always talking about how much do we uh, weigh off like writing things from scratch versus um, using existing um, uh, frameworks or or other th and and uh, uh, that that seems to be settling down to sort of a middle approach um, what uh, we're still working on mapping uh, whether we can get what we need out of leaflet or uh, so I, I don't think that's supposed to be camel case but what we're supposed to get out of leaflet or whether we can get what we need out of leaflet or need to use open layers but what last time we we used a, a full-blown mobile gis from a third party and we um, we don't need to do that that was one of the things that was the uh, a difference between having an academic style workshop and saying, what would you like it to do? And everybody had elaborate in-field mobile GIS, uh, geographic information system stuff to, that they wanted done. Um, and, you know, uh, but then when we look at what they actually used or when we did the more uh, business analysis sort of approach that we did in the uh, CSIRO on prime program where you ask people not what they what not what their wish list is, but what they're willing to pay for. Um, we found out that the mapping's rather more limited so we're, we're taking a lighter weight approach. Um, but uh, and uh, we're trying to make it somewhat less less monolithic now with more of a plug in uh, architecture. So I guess that's some of the highlights. Penny, if you could hit the next slide. Um, it's just this has got some of the things that are planned, but um, and this is a moving target. I think you may have actually been working on elaborating some of these things, but um, uh, but these are, are are some of the other things you know Penny mentioned when she said, well, what did we learn when we went through the CSIRO program uh, on program? Um, you know that that we need better and some of the things were better user management, a, a, a GUI to uh, you know to produce definition files, a web application of some sort, uh, and better round, data round trip. We're targeting interoperability with. Um, 
cloud store and some EOSC nodes that use, uh, that's a European open science cloud. Um, some of their nodes use a similar stack to cloud store and we've got some contacts there. So we're, we're working on that. And electronic lab notebooks, there's some demand um, to be able to capture data in FAMES in network degraded environments and then transfer that data into an electronic lab notebook. And we've got, we're developing a partnership with uh, our space uh, around, uh, around that. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's about where we're at right now, I think. Uh, and I, I, I see we're short of time, so I won't say anything else about, uh, uh, about this. So yeah, uh, Penny, if you want to hit some of the highlights, I guess the big ones are the alpha prototype uh, was uh, finished, uh, 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 got through accept user acceptance testing in mid June. Um, and and it yeah. demonstrates the core functionality of FAMES 3, which is that it's cross platform. We can collect all sorts of data. Um, we have a, a version control of sorts. I know that's being uh, tinkered with at the moment, but it was fantastically joyous to see the ability to capture those records in a cross platform environment. Um, from the final, like final FAMES users perspective, it doesn't look anything like FAMES yet. Uh, but it was very exciting for us to see that core functionality um, just a few months ago. So um, the beta development is ramping up uh, at the moment and it is due at the end of October. So we're very excited to see some of those more famesy features emerging. So it'll look a little bit more like the final production next year. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Penny and Sean. Um, it sounds like a, a really exciting tool and uh, quite versatile uh, in managing to support a wide variety of disciplines. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Very excited to hear a little bit from your perspective about what the, the AAO software team has been contributing to. Uh, I'll open the floor up for questions. Anyone have any questions for Penny or Sean? Well, just while people are finding out how to put up their virtual hands, I might use the chair's privilege and ask a question of my own. Uh, you mentioned early in the discussion of the features uh, ca capacity to link records with particular vocabularies or ontologies. Uh, not being a historian or an archaeologist myself, can you say a little bit more about what a vocabulary and an ontology is in this context? Sure. Sean, do you want to go? Uh, I think you're, uh, I could say a few things, but I think you probably know more about this than I do, Penny. Uh, basically, that so uh, all, ontologies exist in the cultural heritage uh, realm. Uh, the CDOC CRM, which I've forgotten what that stands for, mm -hmm. Penny. If you know the acronym, you can unpack it. But it's yeah, CDOC CRM is an ontology that museums use to uh, classify things in collections. Uh, there have been attempts to, it, people have found it not very well suited to field work. English Heritage tried to make some extensions to it to make it more suited to field work. Uh, Getty has a, 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 an, an ontology for cultural heritage stuff. Um, again, hasn't seen, not, not that great for, for field work. Um, there are, uh, for, you know, the, for the old world, there are things like gas tiers uh, that are available that, that provide a sort of a, you know, standardized vocabulary for referring to place names, um, you know, and then uh, uh, probably the place in our disciplines where um, ontologies have been or vocabularies have been taken up the most is in uh, paleozoology, uh, where, you know, where they can use taxa for animals and, and, pl and paleobotany for plants, plants and animals. Um, so if there's, uh, you know, uh, if you want to refer to a, uh, a you know, a a sheep in, you know, when you're recording sheep bones, you, we can include in that drop, you'll see a drop down that says Ovid or, or, or Ovicaprid or sheep or whatever. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and then it can link to the Encyclopedia of Life, you know, page for, for, for Ovicaprids or whatever, you know, something like that. So we can include URIs in it, like hit sort of hidden from the user. It's just tied to the, uh, to the drop down and what 
I guess the lesson for this is that not very many researchers are actively interested in 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 in, do, in implementing these this kind of either linked open data approach or at least the use of you know vo vocabs ontologies where they exist. Uh, and we found if we want to nudge people in that direction, it kind of all has to happen in the in the background. Um, and other than that, Penny's done some work though that that we are going to publish at some point uh, that that shows that even though everyone is using different terminology, she took a sampling of, of ceramics projects and found that about 70% of the data could be mapped after the fact to, uh, you know, to, to uh, existing vocabularies, ontologies. We're kind of focusing, we, we want to keep some capacity for this ability to use shared vocabularies. Um, you know, one of the interesting things you can do, because we use now an XML file, hopefully later it'll be a JSON file or something to define the data schema. And uh, Steve Cassidy, looking at it as a computer scientist, thinks we can extract the implicit ontologies once we, if we have a large enough vocabulary to, or, sorry, not, a, a large enough library of, of, of modules or customizations for, uh, for the software. Uh, one thing we're looking at doing more now is just because for 10 years, more 15 years, uh, everyone's been trying to browbeat archaeologists and other into using vocabularies, ontologies, and and it still hasn't really happened. We're we're thinking it might be a better approach just to real to document things as well as possible uh, as far as metadata, paradata, you know, me, uh, you know, how was this data collected and what is the data like to have as rich a description as possible to facilitate assessment of the quality of the data utility of the data and post facto uh ex post facto like reconciliation of data sets cool <laughs> penny anything you want to add to that <laughs> that would be really nice <laughs> we could make that happen yeah, but again, because you're defining your 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 sort of your data schemas and your workflows with code here, that that becomes important sort of mm. meta or paradata as well. That you can yeah. take a fames module and you can see what the field protocol was. You, you know, so uh, so that's another reason that that is something that we are really pushing compared to say you know, using uh, Esri ArcGIS collector to go collect your data where you you click through an interface for, you know, a few hours to set your forms up the way that you want them, it, you know, that the, the way that we do it, it you know, in, uh, I think it, if you know what you're doing, it's faster in the first place, but in the, it, you know, in the second place, it, um, it, it, it provides important documentation about your field work because you've got a machine readable file mm -hmm. that says what's your data structure and what's your workflow your, yeah. your series of screens that you 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 know and how they're connected to one another all right let's uh, give Nuria the chance to ask the final question thank you uh thanks Penny and Sean for a great talk um I wonder whether you could say something about your plans for using fames for citizen science I think that's a really exciting concept Penny, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I've sure. been talking uh, too much. So with Fames 26, we had some citizen science projects, which were fantastic and successful. And we have uh, one of the partners on the project now. She was at UCID. She's now at uh, University of Melbourne. And they had a citizen science standalone module for uh, monitoring oyster um, species along reefs in Sydney. She's now collaborating with someone in Hong Kong and is working out a way to get the funding to do a FAMES 3 test case for citizen science in Hong Kong using the module that we developed for Sydney. We'll just switch over the vocabularies. Uh, so FAMES 3 will be better because we'll have a more robust interface for user management. Unlike at the moment, we have a kind of a hokey method of manually entering names and email addresses. With the standalone apps, there was a protocol for requesting login details, but it was a lot of work to manage. So having our, our more advanced um, access for FAMES 3, that's going to be um, fantastic for citizen science projects. And because we have the version history, we have the capacity for sophisticated modules, we have the picture dictionaries, it it really is geared to allow that um, data collection from the very unskilled to the very skilled. 
and it could work uh, really well. So we have some test cases uh, that we're lining up to see how that looks next year. Uh, and I, I do think there'll be a lot of capacity for that kind of project with Bank 3. Awesome, thank you very much. We are a little bit over time, so we probably should wrap things up for today. Uh, but thank you very much once again to, to Sean and Penny. I think this is a very exciting project, very exciting tool to hear about. And uh, I appreciate you both taking the time to come and talk to us about it. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all again at the next seminar. Thanks for, thank having, you for having us. us. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.